Wow. Didn't get an opportunity to read this note a little bit earlier. And I'd like to read this to you now. Uh, thank you to my wonderful church family. Your love, compassion, faith, prayers, <coughs> financial support have uh, carried me through so much difficulty one day. Uh, I will be whole again and be able to help more. I have been a member of many churches, but this is the best ever. Uh, thank you. In God's love, Emily. Emily, thank you so much. Again, if you would, turn with me to Matthew 5. And I really didn't believe this day was going to get over with, or going to get started, I should say. Yeah. A few minutes ago, I thought, oh, let's get it over with. Last week we talked about, um, in the, or two weeks ago, we talked about the Beatitudes. We talked about the peacekeepers, and often that uh, peacekeepers avoid conflict to keep peace. And peacemakers embrace conflict to make peace. And so as we begin to read in Matthew 5, we will begin in verse 3 as we read through them, as we address the, one of the, uh, the last Beatitude this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God, and blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much for the beautiful day that you've given us, and Lord, I thank you for so many new faces that are in our congregation this morning. We thank you for those precious gifts that you have entrusted us with today. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with Jim and Jean as they are on the road, and Father, with the, the death in their family and how tragic it was and how fast it came, and all of a sudden it was there. And Lord, we ask that you just be with them and comfort their whole family during this time of mourning. We ask that you uh, be with Jim as he delivered his service, but as he ministers to his family, to bring them back safely to his Father. Lord, we thank you for him and for his service to you and his love for this church. And Lord God, may you just bless this service today. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So blessed are the <clears throat> persecuted, those who are persecuted. Now notice in this one, it's not saying blessed are those. It says blessed are those who are persecuted because of or, or blessed. I'm going to get it all wrong here. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you. But blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so today we want to look at one of the things that we've been looking at through this whole theme of the Beatitudes is bless our home is that we are not just a Christ-centered home. We are not just a Christ-centered church. We are a Christ-centered family. We are a Christ-centered church. And so it's more than just being a Christian. It's more than just saying the word, I am a believer. It's living it. It's righteous living, living out, lived out among people that we come in contact with each and every day. So today's key thought is this. If you are a Christ-centered family, you will be persecuted. Many of us that sit here today think our Christian life is so enjoyable. We don't ever first face persecution. We never have to endure pain. And so there was a church that uh, decided that they wanted to do something unique, and they... Uh, got this huge balloon and they began to, to fly this balloon over their community and they would call them bombs but they were flyer bombs and they were about their church 
And so they'd drop them and they would fall over the community and the people would pick them up and the community tolerated it for some time and they actually enjoyed it. And then they began to go on the loudspeaker. And so they thought, you know, we've gone this far, we've done this, people responded well, we've had people come to our church. And so now we're gonna do this. And so then when they put the loudspeaker on, they began to go through the community while it was not received as well as you might expect. And they began to receive persecution. You know, sometimes persecution can come as a result of what we do, not of what we've done. And so we look at God, and God is drawing us close to him. And William Blake writes these words in these moving lies. He says, joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twin. And it should be twine. Blake understood that the joy of woe are part of the fabric of life that God weaves and lovingly fits perfectly a clothing in and around his children. But there's a great comfort in the fact that God is the weaver. Blake understood the joy, <clears throat> excuse me, in the woe and the part of the fact that God is weaving and lovingly putting us, his children, together, but for the great comfort in fact. But as we take up this final beatitude and find a divinely composed paradox, that has similar mystery for it involves a relationship of persecution and joy to read this beatitude for the first time is shocking to some and imagine hearing these lines for the first time as you open your word blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are, the, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Matthew 5, 12 through 10. So how do we prepare our family? How do we prepare our church for persecution? First of all, we've got to expect it. We have to expect that if we are going to be doing the right things by God, we are going to face persecution. In your own life, if you are living a righteous life for God, you will see persecution. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, In fact, everyone who lives, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Here Paul's advice to Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ will be persecuted. Paul also warned the Thessalonians, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we, with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it had come to pass. Just as you know, and that was in 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 through 4, and that wasn't in your notes this morning. Likewise, in Acts 14, 22, he told the Christ, Christians in Antioch, through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom of God. You see, if we have to expect it. If we're not doing what God has called us to do, and we are not receiving persecution, we need to sit back and we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Are we ministering to the lost? Are we being the person in the workplace that God's called us to be? You see, God calls you out as a believer to do great and mighty things for him. He doesn't call you to just sit idle. He doesn't call you to just come to church on Sunday or on Wednesday night Bible study or on Sunday night evening or a fellowship. God calls you to be his disciple all the time. He asks you to take the word to every corner of the earth. Many of us can't do that, but through our funds that we send our missionaries, we can. Some of you minister to other people in, in hospitals as volunteers. 
what a great opportunity it is to witness to the sick and those that are dying. Sometimes you may face persecution. John 15, 18 through 20 says, If the world hates you, keep in mind they hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Secondly, we must endure it. When we face persecution and we expect it, then next we must endure it. How do we endure persecution? Many of us go through our whole life and never face a bit of persecution. Some of us think it's because somebody gets mad at us and we think that's persecution. We think we've got our feelings hurt because somebody has taken us off Facebook and, and oh, they hurt my feelings and, and gee, man, I'm not part of their social network anymore. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.12, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When family identity is strong, when a family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. When a family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. Think about that. I have seen so many families that are so woven so tightly together and have such a bond with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that their kids live that life out all the time. Your kids may stray. God bring them back. I hope we pray that all the time. We have kids right now that stray. And we pray to God that he will bring them back. But it's only God that can bring them back. All we can do is invite them. You know, sadly, Christians often uh, are very often persecuted not for their Christianity, but for their lack of it. Sometimes they are rejected simply because they have an unpleasing personality. They are rude, insensitive, <clears throat> thoughtless, pious, obnoxious. Some are rejected because they are discerned as a proud and judgmental people. Others are disliked because they are lazy and irresponsible. Incompetence mixed with piety is sure to bring reject rejection. And so how do we endure it? We know right here that we don't endure it by being pious. We don't endure it by being legalistic. All we do is chase people away. When you walk through this door of the church, I hope you feel the love of Jesus Christ and every single person that's here. Because most of you, are, or the biggest majority of you that are here, are because of that. It's because of that love of Christ that is seen in each and every one of you. It's not seen as being pious, but I'm sure there's times that we can be. Jesus is trying to give us righteous rules here live our life by. So many people debate about what Jesus is really saying here. Does he mean that we're talking about the end life or, and what it's going to be like in heaven? Or are we talking about when we become Christians, this is the righteous way that we're supposed to live our life? Jesus is giving us a pure example. And thirdly, <coughs> we are to embrace it. How many of us embrace the thought of being persecuted? Did you walk in that door today and say, oh, I'm going to embrace that thought of being persecuted? 1 Peter 4, 12, 13, and 16 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you, on you to test you, as though something strange were to happen. But rejoice in as much as you participated in the sufferings of Christ, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear 
that name. The real tra tragedy of persecution, there are times. But the tragedy today is not that they happen to believers, but they are very often that they do not. One reason is, is that many Christians are cut off from the world. They go to church, 100% Christians, exercise with other believers. Boy, I'm glad I came today. They attend Christian schools. They attend Bible studies that are just 100% Christians. They exercise and they garden with other church goers and golf with church goers and go on trips with church goers and thus are sealed away. <coughs> from the rest of the world. And persecution. Others keep their Christianity secret so as not to make ways with non-Christians because they might not like us. The tragedy is, is that hidden Christianity is probably not Christianity at all. But by far the greatest reason there is so little persecution is that the church has become just like the world today. And it's sad when you hear it on TV and you see it yourself. If you want to get along, the formula is simple. Approve of the world's morals. Approve of the world's ethics. And least outwardly. Live like the world lives. Laugh at all of its humor that it puts in your face. Immense yourself in all the entertainment that you can see and indulge yourself in. Smile benignly when God is mocked. Act as if religious converge on the same road. Don't mention hell in any subject that you talk to a non-believer. Draw no moral judgments. Take no stand on moral or political issues. Above all, do not share your faith. Follow the formula. It's smooth sailing and I don't have to do a thing. All I have to do is come through the door on Sunday morning in the fellowships, in the Bible studies, and alienate myself from the rest of the world so I can feel good about myself. But the fact is the church must be persecuted or it is no church at all. There is a price to pay. And when you look in Revelations 2 and 3 and you see and it talks about the lampstands and the churches and, and John is talking about the revelation that's just been revealed to him. He's talking to the church of Ephesus and he's giving them a warning. They're doing all the right things for God. They're living all the right ways. They're rebuking. They're telling about all the teachers that are wrong and what they say. But they're not loving. They forgot what it was like to be persecuted. They've become just like the society that they were living in. And in jeopardy of losing the light of God. You see, there is a price to pay. That price was paid for each and every one of us on the cross of Calvary. And on that cross of Calvary was a price was God's son. God manifested himself just like you and I. And he walked this earth. And they hung him on a tree. And oh yeah, he was persecuted. He was spit on. He was despised. But he gave us right rules for right living for us to go by. Not for us to just enjoy with other Christian people. For us to take the world take the word out that door to a world that's lost. You see, our reward is in heaven. We will walk with the classy com company with the likes of Jeremiah, with the likes of Elijah. We will see him face to face. I get goosebumps thinking about it. 
what a life that will be. But what is it is that we live here on this earth comfortably. You all know what Elijah did and, and how he ran from Jezebel. You all know the persecution. You can read it of all the great heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. We can see about what suffering is all about. What are you doing for God today? What are you doing to reach the lost in this community? Because if each one reaches one, then this place would be full. If we were doing what we were supposed to do, we would do it and we would be persecuted for it. Where are our kids today? Where are our grandkids today? Where are our great grandkids today? Are we still an influence and an impact in their life? Are we still teaching them the principles of what God's word says? Are we telling them that they must endure it? They must inspect it, expect it? And then it's going to happen? And prepare them for this world? Because if we don't, we're going to lose another generation. Think about what that means. Think about that. That is tragic. That's pious. When we allow a generation to miss out on the love of God. But we sit there and tell them that this life is going to be so joyous and so wonderful and you don't have to do nothing. All you have to do is accept Jesus and that's it. <clears throat> Remember, there was a price that was paid and the expectation for you is high. And it's not just on Sunday morning. It's every single breath that you take, every single step that you take, every place you go, everywhere you anybody you talk to. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about living that life that he's called you to live and live it so abundantly. My grandson, so I'm going to end with this. Got a text. I don't get to see my grandson very much. I'm in Broken Arrow and I don't get to see him very much. Son-in-law texted me the other day and he said, Dad, you'd be so proud of Mace. He said, oh, he loves his sports and you'd love him for that, but you'll love him more because he loves Jesus Christ and he is six years old. He loves Jesus Christ with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is a six-year-old and he's already trying to memorize the book of John and I'm loving it because he's already to chapter 3. And I'm not just bragging on him for that, but they're teaching him the right things. And I praise God that I prayed for that man to marry my daughter. But I also told him this. When it gets that day when that young man wants to be a minister to the Lord, don't change his mind and tell him, no, you need to go into this field of expertise because you will earn more money. Let me tell you today, there is nothing more satisfying than what I do as a preacher than standing before you preaching the word of God and being persecuted for doing it. How are you Father, we come to you today. We thank you so much for your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we have not become so complacent in the way that we live our life. That, Father, we have surrounded ourselves with nothing but believers and walked the world out. 
us through this Easter season, Father, to remember Jesus and what he has done for us. I pray, Heavenly Father, if there's one here this morning that's hurting, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would call them. I pray that they would accept you as a personal Savior. I pray, Father, that if there's one here this morning that is looking for a church home, that, Father, that you would allow us to be their home. I thank you for the expectations that you put on us and that you expect from us. May we leave this place today, Father, with you on our hearts, with you on our mouth as we go into the world to serve for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This morning the invitations, Claire is, is she Lindsay comes and sings. Won't you come? Won't you come? <laughs> Accept him as your personal savior. Yes, I do. Congratulations. I knew it was never a Anyone else? Just don't stop there. Just keep it going. Guests, thank you so much for being in our church home this morning. You are very important.
important to us. You mean a lot to us, and thank you for being with us. And can I turn it back over to Mary? As they pass out the emblems this morning, if you wish, hold them. We'll take them in front. For you who may be here for the first time, we have open communion for all the ladies. 